It's Fed Day. We've got tapering or we don't have tapering. All of that and more coming right up with Peter Bookvar, who is the CIO of the Bleakley Advisory Group and editor of the Book Report. Welcome back to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Thanks, Ed, for having me on. Yeah, so uh, a lot to talk about, especially with regard to the Fed. Uh, I saw that bond yields were down ever so slightly. What do you think about what the Fed had, had to say? What's your macro sort of takeaway? Well, I'll, I'll preface it by uh, saying that, that people that have heard and seen me, they're probably tired of my criticism of the Fed. Uh, but I'm going to have no choice today but to, to rant again uh, about the Fed and, and, and Jay Powell, because there, there seems to be this like ever-growing chasm between their policy and, and the reality of the world. Uh, their policy, of course, being as easy for as long as possible with, with no hint of tapering until they meet uh, some metrics that they can't even themselves define. Powell can't even define what substantial progress is uh, when asked about it. And then the reality is that we have uh, what I believe are major intensifying inflation pressures that the Fed in their statement and Powell in the press conference uh, continue to refer as transitory. Uh, well, they better hope that it's transitory or else they're going to be mugged by some serious reality this summer and uh, they're not going to be allowed to wait any longer uh, in, in terms of pulling back uh, policy because if they, if they continue as is and don't pull back, uh, then the market's going to have another leg higher uh, in the level of interest rates. And yeah, the 10-year the pulled back a little bit today, but at the high, we were up 10 basis points in just a couple of days. And what is noteworthy is that inflation expectations in the tips market continue to move higher. Uh, in fact, the biggest move of the day in the entire Treasury market was looking at break-evens three years out, which saw a rise of almost nine basis points just today alone. So we're now approaching at least three years out, the highest level since 2006. So that's even before uh, things blew up in, uh, in, in the housing bubble aftermath. So uh, I, I think that uh, the Fed is, is really uh, continuing to drive a car 200 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour speed zone, and the roads are getting icier. Well, it sounds to me like what you're saying, Peter, is that we're looking at just a pause right now. You know, we we got over the 175 hump just very, ever so briefly once or twice, and we pulled back. We were in the 150s. Now we're actually back to the 160s. You think you said there's going to be a retest. Uh, what kind of levels are you looking at, and over what time frame do you think this retest is going to happen? Well, we, we got extremely overbought in yield, oversold in price uh, when the 10-year yield got to about 178, 177, and we've sort of working that off. Uh, so I think that 150, 175 could be a trading range for the next month or two as we, we get through what is already been priced in these high inflation numbers. But if the month over month, putting aside, you know, Jay Powell likes to talk about base effects in year over year, but if the month over month inflation numbers in the next couple of months, surprise to the upside, then I believe that we're going to be breaking above that one and three quarters level on the 10 year. Because what we're going to see, I believe, in the next couple of months, and maybe even it stretches into the summer, is that the, the Treasury market is going to again tighten in the face of, of uh, in, in, in notwithstanding the Fed. So we know, we know what the Fed thinks. We know that they're just going to sit there and do nothing. Um, the bond market's already sort of tightened for them already. I mean, the, the, the five years, so the, the two years very much pinned, of course, because the Fed funds rate. That's why I think it's important to really look at the five year because it, it is sort of in that middle ground between being influenced by the Fed funds rate, but still having some market characteristics. That rate closed today at 85 basis points. It was about 35 basis points on December 31st. So at least the five year has essentially tightened uh, twice. And you look at the 10 year, it's essentially tightened three times. And I think we're going to go through another round of tightening uh, in the next couple of months because these inflation numbers, I believe, are not going to prove so transitory. You know, we're focusing on inflation. Really, and I, I, I was going to say, you know, we're focusing on inflation now. But Jay Powell, when he was talking, he was saying, you know, we gave you some numbers, uh, some targets to hit. 
there it seems like there are three targets. There's the um, you know they have the dual mandate, so that's inflation. They also have uh, unemployment, and they also have GDP growth. Just overall, the overall economy. How important are those other two components in the mix in terms of what's going to force the Fed to react most aggressively? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, they can't even define the answer to that question themselves. They can't tell us what substantial progress means. Uh, I don't know if that means a, uh, a, a five handle on the unemployment rate, a four handle, a three handle. Uh, I don't know if that means um, uh, getting back the jobs that were lost, uh, even though Powell even admitted that some of these jobs may not be coming back because uh, for, for a variety of reasons that there's I mean, he acknowledged that there's there's a large demand for labor right now that's not being met. So for him to just sit there and say we're not going to do anything until that 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 um, uh, number comes down of the, those that lost their jobs, well, it's going to come back on its own with the reopening, and it's not going to come down that fast because we know for reasons that there's right now friction in the labor market where the supply side's not meeting the demand side. On the inflation side, he can't even define you know what symmetry means. I mean, two percent average. Well, how many, what average are we taking? Are we taking a one year average, a two year average, a five year average, a 10 year average, a 30 year average? What does that even mean? So the, the Fed is just winging it. Uh, listening to Powell today was, was, was painful. I mean, he had like scripted answers to some of these questions uh, and, and even to the, to the housing question, which I'm glad that somebody asked that you have in, in the, in the, uh, the Case Shiller index yesterday for the month of February, even though it's somewhat dated showing that home prices are rising now at a 12% year-over-year rate. That's even before the easy comms kick in, at least for March and April. And he's talking about like household balance sheets and, and, and bank stability and their exposure to the housing market, not acknowledging that 12% is serious housing price inflation that uh, is pricing out potentially uh, a generation of home buyers, first-time home buyers, young home buyers, that want to buy a home, and, and 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 the Fed is just juicing it. And then they ask, well, somebody asked, well, why are you buying mortgage-backed securities with what's going on in the housing market? And he's like, well, we're buying it because 13 months ago we had an issue in the mortgage market, and I guess we're just still buying it because we're just still buying it. I mean, he he he's it's just it's uh it, it's scary to listen to him as as, as Fed chair, and uh, I don't know if there's a fear of tapering and what that means for a recovery that's just trying to get its legs or a level of cluelessness about what's going on around him. Uh, but I do know that, that um, like I said earlier, the market is going to mug him, uh, uh, I believe, uh, this summer when uh, these inflation numbers are not going to prove so temporary. You know, I, I think of him in the same seat as Bernanke or uh, Greenspan and Yellen, and it's clear to me that we're talking about someone who's not just representing his views, but he's representing the whole the 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 consensus view, if you will, of the FOMC. So that's a tough balancing act to to play. How much do you think uh, the balance of power within the FOMC is behind some of what he's saying and how he's saying it, and how much of it is uh, Jay Powell himself uh, telling you straight what he believes? Well. I, I think Powell is a lightweight, so he is probably hearing from others and 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 incorporating that into his message. But Greenspan told you what Greenspan thought. Uh, Bernanke did what he wanted to do, whether you agreed with what it was or not. He did what he wanted to do, and he had others coalesce around his thinking. That's that's the thing is that you're a Fed chair. You try to get others to agree with you. You absorb other people's opinions. But what we've seen in the past is. Is, uh, is, is the chair trying to have others coalesce around the chair's view. Yellen, you know, I'm not really sure. I mean, she had her view, and she probably tried to get others to agree with her. Powell is just seemingly all over the place, uh, which tells me that he just doesn't have uh, a firm belief on things and is taking input from others. But it's clear that they're just deathly afraid to disrupt things. Uh, but the problem that I think they're going to have is they feel like they're still in control, as based on the statement, based on his comments, that they're still in control of the narrative, that they are still in control of the yield curve. And I think what we've seen so far, 
to, to sound like a broken record, is that, that they're not in so much control and that the bond market now has a voice. They have a voice and they've expressed that voice. And that's why, again, to repeat, the, fi the five-year yield has gone from 35 basis points to 85 basis points without any change whatsoever in Fed rhetoric. So, Peter, let me just expand this. I know we're uh, we're talking about the Fed, and this and that my lead-in was about the Fed. But the reality is, is is that we're also in the United States at, at a minimum looking at some serious fiscal action. We have uh, uh, Joe Biden about to make a speech today uh, based upon a massive change in fiscal policy, and I want to talk about this in the context of. Uh, global divergence of policy or the potential for global divergence and what it means in terms of your thinking about tactical strategies and your um, your longer term investment strategies, uh, whether it be for the United States, you talk about Asian assets, but I also I'm thinking about Europe in particular. The way that I would put it is that Biden is going to tell us today that he's going to have a massive spending program. And it's also going to be uh, uh, more taxes, particularly on the rich. And that's going to go in concert with everything that you said about the Fed in terms of continued uh, monetary accommodation. To me, that speaks to a potential that we're at the maximum point of uh, United States outperformance, maximum easiness relative to other countries, maximum easiness on the fiscal and on the monetary policy front, and potentially also, you know, maximum GDP growth relative to other countries because of the emergence out of the pandemic. Uh, what does that mean? First of all, is that even true? And then secondly, if it is, what does that mean in terms of your tactical view on all sorts of assets? Well, uh, on the fiscal side, what, when they just spent almost two trillion, a good chunk of that, six seven hundred billion, went directly into the economy. You know, via the the checks and the extended unemployment benefits. So that had an immediate impact. The infrastructure bill, even if they got a fraction of that passed, that's going to be spread out over eight years. What he's going to talk about tonight is just social social welfare spending. Whether they agree with it or not, that's what it is. So that has that had doesn't have an immediate impact on on economic growth. So that's not really fiscal stimulus. That's just social spending. So I, I think that the 1.9 was sort of peak fiscal stimulus spending. Uh, again, because the impact is immediate as opposed to this the, this other. So really, to get to your point is is that by 2022, are we going to have this fiscal cliff that we hear about? Um, but before I get to that. What will have an immediate offset to the spending is these tax increases that are going to happen in year one, where the other spending is going to be spread out over multiple years. So you can even argue that there's actually fiscal contraction coming because of these tax increases. Then we'll have to see in 2022, when you get this fiscal hangover from the <laughs> 1.9 trillion that was just spent on top of the 900 billion that was spent in December, uh, you're going to get some hangover there. The hope is, of course, that you hand the economic baton off to the private sector and you won't necessarily have much of a pullback. But you can be sure in an election year, there'll be another one to two trillion dollar check giveaway in 2022, because the last thing they want to preside over is uh, a, a fiscal cliff, a decline in the economy ahead of the midterm elections. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I, I think that last point is very important that even to the degree that you think that inflation prints are going to be uh, poor and you think that there's a fiscal cliff coming, if that is occurring at the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022, that gives Democrats who control both the houses of Congress and the presidency time to enact legislation in order to uh, get things going again before the midterm elections. So it would suggest that uh, we are in a cycle now where we're going to continue to see some level of stimulus for the next year and a half. I, I, I believe that that's their plan. That they're, they're not going to let, uh, like I said, the, the, the fiscal fall off occur in, in 2022 in an election year. They're, they're just not as, they're just not going to let it happen. Uh, you now, how they'll spend that money and, 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 and 
to what extent we'll have to see, but uh, I'm sure they'll do their best to try to get more checks out the door, uh, you know, to, 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 to help the economy not contract or not pull back at all ahead of those elections. And so how does that compare to other countries that you're looking at, both in terms of the effectiveness of the programs that they're implementing or likely to implement, uh, in terms of their economies getting off the ground after the pandemic, uh, and what your ultimate asset allocation thinking is? We know about being bullish in Asia, but how do other emerging markets, how, how do, does Europe enter into that picture? Well, Europe, of course, is going to be uh, allocating the, the, the 750 billion euro uh, split between grants and loans to uh, individual countries. And then those individual countries, of course, are going to be coming up with their own plans to, to allocate it from this you know, top-down perspective. Uh, but that money is going to be spread out over a couple of years. That is, is when, you, when you read about how they're, I mean, it's just central planning writ large is, is how this money is going to be allocated. So uh, I, I'm not very confident about you know, the, the, the economic uh, impetus that it's going to give uh, to that region. So then you look at Asia where they're not relying on uh, a lot of fiscal spending to, to, to generate economic growth. Um, they're sort of recovering on their own. I mean, even China is trying to sort of slow down the, uh, the, the credit growth that they've seen. Um, so I, I, I don't know, F fiscal spending and just throwing money out there uh, doesn't really have um, much of a multiplier effect more than one. In fact, many studies have it less than one. So it ends up being more of a waste of money more than anything. So that leads you further toward a overweight uh, Asia over the United States and, and also over Europe. It, it's Asia is my favorite region, uh, but it's also still the reflation trade in the U.S. It's 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 commodity stocks, uh, energy and, and agriculture and precious metals and industrial metals. Uh, it's also there's still, I believe, some attractive value stuff out there. That uh, is is not in part of the Reddit crowd or uh, part of the, the you know the tech stocks that everyone loves. You know the, the thing about investing right now, I think it's you really have to have either, and I might have said this before on the show, is that you either have to have a really short term time horizon uh, in, in in order to have a trade work and be ready to to jump off at the uh, at, at the right time, or you get to have have to have a really long time long term time horizon to sort of block out the noise and absorb. But the potential bumps in the road over the next six months. When you think about the next six months, again, it's the rate story, it's the inflation story, and it's just going to be growing intense pressure on the Fed to taper. And uh, I'm not even going to talk about raising rates because they're not going to do that for a while. But I just think that the, the, the pressure on tapering is going to be extraordinary. I mean, even the ECB has even talked about how the June meeting is going to be more heated uh, with respect to the tapering of their uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. Uh, right now, that's supposed to go until March 2022, but there's intense pressure internally that uh, may not last that long. So you look at the back half of 2021, and there's going to be not just taper talk in the U.S., it's going to be also uh, in Europe, and it could be for the U.K. We know the Bank of Canada has already uh, begun to slow the pace of their uh, QE program. So that, that's what we have to look forward to. Uh, so at the same, on, on one hand, you know, we're, we're optimistic about growth and the vaccine and so on, but a, a lot of this monetary largest... Uh, I think is is going to be put to the test in the second half. Yeah, and you know when you talk about the time frames, I think that's a very apropos thing to talk about because when you talk about the pressures that are going to be in the back half, the real question I have is what does that mean for inflation hedges like uh, um, commodities, and also what does it mean for precious metals? Because that could be an environment in which uh, real interest rates are actually increasing, which would be negative for precious metals. How do you play precious metals? What's the time frame that you're looking at? I actually think real rates are going to take another leg down because I think that uh, inflation uh, is going to rise faster than the move in rates. And, um, and I think you listen to Powell today and you just no wonder the dollar is rolling over. I mean, the, the, the dollar index, and granted, it's, it's euro heavy, uh, it's now trading below its 50, 100, and 200-day moving average. 
So to me, Powell just sort of gave the green light to the, the, the dollar bear trade, uh, the negative real rate trade, and the bullish precious metal trade. Right. Yes, I spoke to David Rosenberg earlier today. Uh, I noted in one of his um, notes recently, he was talking about DXY and Fibonacci retracements. Uh, he was talking about versus the euro. And it seems, yeah, with the dollar, I'm looking at it at 90.6 right now that right. we've definitely broken through some some levels. Uh, how do you see that playing out over the next few months? Do you think that the dollar has more weakness to come or are there support levels that you're looking at? I, I think it's breaking below 90 and, and not just you know, higher inflation that's going to surprise, I believe, that's dollar negative, but these perpetual uh, budget deficits that are clearly apparent with all the money that Washington continues to spend. I mean, a, a winding budget deficit is, is currency negative. So you have higher inflation, you have the deficits. I mean, we, we saw today the goods trade deficit for March hit a fresh record high. So between the trade deficit, the current account deficit, obviously with you know that being included, uh, the budget deficit, the higher inflation, to me this is all dollar negative, and um, I, I expect another leg lower. Right. So what are we missing now? What's different, if anything, about the environment that we're in today than the last time that you and I talked? We have the the Fed's uh, uh, statement that came out. I don't really see that as a big difference. Um, I see the the move lower in the dollar and also the move higher in interest rates as uh, key differences. Uh, what are the differences that you're seeing? Well, seeing that, we're also seeing you know more optimism about growth. Uh, Atlanta Fed GDP, their forecast for Q1 is now up to eight percent. We're seeing some some a good set of earnings where uh, a good amount are are putting up good numbers, particularly tech and 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 certainly Google and Facebook and. Uh, you know, I know Apple's on the tape, but I haven't really dug through them yet. Uh, Microsoft, even though the stock traded down, great numbers. So that, that, that's still a story here where uh, a good chunk of, of big cap tech are putting up impressive numbers. Uh, the question is, is what multiple pay on that uh, if, the, if the rate story um, continues with, with, with them moving higher as the year progresses? Uh, but at least, again, from where we spoke a couple weeks ago, uh, earnings so far uh, so good. Yeah, well, th that that's great. So, uh, what what are your views there? I mean, uh, let's say that uh, rates do go higher. Um, we still do get um, nice. Uh, people are expecting good things out of of Apple. Uh, we saw Microsoft was positive. Uh, where do you rotate in the United States? You were saying earlier today. Uh, you know, if you're trading on a tactical basis, it's like you know those things they roll through very quickly. Where are you on that right now? On, on, on the short term side, I'm just more, uh, I don't know. The market seems to have been very, seems to be very rotational. Uh, they've certainly you know some froth has come out of the SPAC market and 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 uh, the, the the work from home stocks that worked so well last year, like Zoom. Uh, obviously, the big cap tech took a break for seven or eight months, but they're sort of obviously heating up again uh, with with its leg up. Um, I, I think the, the, the short term is, is tough to call. I mean, where, where you look at the sentiment, sentiment numbers, you know, they're very stretched. Uh, we're overbought. We're overloved. Uh, but that can stay that way. But on the other hand, it can stop at any moment. So short term is really tough to call, to be honest. And so you're just going to stick with uh, your geographic weighting. What's your yeah. industry and stylistic weighting? Right. I'm, you know, I'm trying to stick with more of a long term time horizon because the short term is just too dizzying to me. Now, I, I have opinions on the short term in terms of macro and, and on the interest rate and inflation side, uh, but where the market's going right now, uh, I, I, I just, you know, when, when, when it just gets, feel, has this frothy, frothy feel, it just makes me nervous. But again, the frothy feel can, can remain that way for a period of time before it matters. Right. And, and so that's why I'm thinking uh, longer term, what are you thinking from a, um, equity sector allocation or from a stylistic allocation? I, I, I'm, I'm tilted to overseas. I mean, I even have some European stocks uh, that, that, that I find attractive on a valuation basis. Uh, so I'm still tilting toward, towards the value stuff and things outside the U.S. and the commodity trade and some select value stuff in the U.S. Um, and, and, and avoiding 
you know, the overloved, overvalued stuff in the U.S. And what does that and mean in terms of oil and financials in particular? Um, financials mostly uh, HSBC, Mitsubishi, UFJ in Japan. Um, now, I, because I think the yield curve is, is going to steepen further, I'm sure U.S. banks will will trade well in that environment. But uh, more trading playing that uh, in, with banks overseas. But uh, you know, I, I I hear Powell today, and I just get more bulled up on precious metals. Excellent. Well, Peter, we're going to have to leave it there. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Joe Biden has to say and what people react to that. Maybe uh, that will change your mind about how important that is. But uh, let's take a look and see. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. For sure. Thanks so much, Ed. I appreciate uh, being on and always fun.